The year is 2005. You're 12 years old and sitting in your living room after coming home from school. And you've just turned on Cartoon Network to tune in to the Toonami Block. As you anxiously await the next installment of an animated series that's slowly been taking the West by storm. Naruto is undoubtedly one of the most iconic anime to ever be broadcast to a Western audience, and its effects on said audience can still be felt today. But it wasn't the only anime during this time that was grabbing the attention of large swaths of potential new anime fans. Together with two other titles, Naruto was bestowed a moniker that signaled a level of popularity and esteem within the Western anime fanbase that very few anime have managed to capture before or since since then. These titles were simply known as the Big Three. The Big Three were a dominating force in the West for years. However, much like many other things in life, the Big Three did not last forever. As the 2010s rolled on, members of the Big Three began peeling off and concluding, and by early 2017, only one remained. It's been over two and a half years since then, and with new Shonen Jump properties continuously rising to popular acclaim as they usually do, we've also seen a rise in people proclaiming that X shows are the new big three. To be honest, this is fairly predictable behavior, especially considering how some people in the gaming community talk about a property like Dark Souls. But, much like saying X is the Dark Souls of Y, it's still an inaccurate way of viewing the situation. Much like how Dark Souls was much more than just a really difficult video game, the Big Three were much more than just the most popular shows in the anime fandom. They were entirely a product of the circumstances in which they were created and how they were distributed to fans, and to recreate these circumstances would be practically impossible in the modern anime scene. In order to explain why though, we first have to examine what the big three are, both in regards to what types of stories they present, and the context in which those stories were presented to the audience. If you're unfamiliar, the big three are a collection of three different anime, Naruto, Bleach, and One Piece, and these titles all share many narrative and distributional similarities. All three of them are adaptations of manga that ran in Weekly Shonen Jump, the most popular manga magazine in the world. They all began circulation in Jump within a five-year span, with their anime adaptations following a similar pattern, and in regard to their Western debuts, these premieres were even closer together at less than two years apart. All of them fall into the action-adventure genre with varying levels of fantasy elements, and they all contain extensive amounts of world-building and different types of power systems, as is typical of a Shonen Jump series. In terms of structure, all three are extremely long, with even the shortest of their anime adaptations lasting for over 350 episodes. Not only are the entire stories at large massive in scale, but the smaller stories within the bigger picture are still incredibly lengthy, thus leading fans to segment those stories into smaller chunks known as arcs. The content of these stories share not only direct similarities, but indirect ones as well. At one point or another, all three of the authors behind the Big Three have stated that Dragon Ball was a significant influence on their works, which should seem kinda obvious. Dragon Ball is one of the most iconic anime of all time, but it's still important that this fact be at the forefront of this discussion, especially considering the international climate. Anime's rise in the West has no shortage of coverage, and by and large, most people agree that the premiere of Dragon Ball Z on Western television is perhaps the most important moment for anime on the global stage. The meteoric rise of DBZ's popularity is, without a doubt, what spurred the exponential growth of the Western anime community in these early years. Plenty of anime had debuted in the West prior to DBZ, but none came anywhere close in terms of popularity and mass market appeal. 
But again, like most things, DBZ didn't last forever. And even as young children, a lot of us understood that something like Dragon Ball GT was simply an inferior product cashing in on name recognition. So, instead of staying glued to a lesser product with the same name, fans sought out new products with a similar feel at the same level of quality they were subconsciously expecting. And licensing companies who were bringing anime over to the West at this time understood this. The obvious influence of Dragon Ball on the Big Three made them perfect candidates for capturing the anime crowd's attention. And their longevity also meant that, if successful, they would become a profitable venture for years years to come, and those licensees were right on the money, though unfortunately not entirely flawless in executing these plans. Yo! However, despite some rocky starts, all three of these shows eventually found their way to the top of the chart, forming the legendary triumvirate we know today. If you've only gotten into anime in the past few years or so, then the concept of just three shows dominating everything for years might sound kind of strange to you. But the fact is that the big three were inescapable within the Western anime fandom for a very long time, and their seemingly endless length and ease of access were the biggest contributions to this popularity. These are also the two primary factors for why there will never be another big three. So let's break down both of those ideas in detail. First, let's tackle the incredible girth of storytelling that the Big Three bring to the table. The seemingly never-ending nature of the Big Three was not only a major selling point as to why you should watch them, but also a key factor in why they retained a constant level of popularity from a marketing standpoint. If a series never stops being broadcast, then there's less of a dire need to remind fans of upcoming episodes. People who are already invested in the series know that there's going to to be a new episode every week, so they're going to tune in even without a reminder. Additionally, having a series be talked about constantly and hearing about all the crazy turns it takes over the course of its run makes it more likely that new fans will hop in and see what everyone's talking about. Catching up also wasn't as much of a chore back then because, while these series were still incredibly long, they weren't at the behemoth lengths that they eventually became. The fact that these series also had their western debuts at relatively the same time also laid the groundwork for a another fundamental facet of the Big Three's existence within the fandom, and it's a concept which exists to some degree within basically all fandoms. Which one is the best? Much like how Star Wars and Star Trek fans would argue that their respective franchise is better than the other, if you were a fan of a specific member of the Big Three, it became your solemn duty to explain why the one you're watching was the best, both to people unfamiliar with it and those who were bigger fans of the other two. Naruto fans would constantly spar with Bleach and One Piece fans and try to argue the merits of their specific favorite. And in truth, there was a lot to argue about. However, this kind of extensive length of debate and popularity is basically impossible to recreate in the modern anime climate because most anime aren't produced in the same way that the big three were. Finding an anime that runs for an entire year in the current anime climate that isn't basically a toy commercial is hard enough, let alone one that runs non-stop like the big three. And of the ones that do, they don't end up dominating discussion like the Big Three. Sure, Boruto and Black Clover are popular, but they pale in comparison to whatever seasonal show grabs the spotlight for a particular season. In contrast, most anime that premiere nowadays that could even be considered long-running in any meaningful capacity are more likely to take on a seasonal format, where a certain length of the source material is adapted over just one or two cores, maybe three if it's JoJo, meaning that most anime only hold the spotlight for half a year of time at the most, unless it immediately gets a Toonami broadcast as soon as it's over. 
Yes, some shows like My Hero Academia manage to hold a consistent level of popularity, but interest in Hiroaka still dies down when it's not currently airing. Even the most popular modern anime don't feel as ubiquitous or omnipresent as the big three did when they were all airing together. It's why it took so long for the hype around Attack on Titan to rebuild once Season 2 finally came out. And while it has been extremely popular in discussion again, as per recent seasonal iterations, it's hard to deny that 2015 and 2016 were significantly lacking in Attack on Titan discussion. There's also a more story-oriented reason for why even the most popular jump anime don't hold public attention for extreme lengths of time anymore, and it lies in the concept of arcs I mentioned earlier. As I've already stated, because the big three and other shonen manga like them are so massive in length, the stories are often divided into smaller segments called arcs. However, if you were to take any random jump manga that premiered in this decade and compare it to the big three, you'll notice that the lengths of individual arcs have become significantly shorter. The longest arc in My Hero Academia so far is the Shie Hasaikai arc, the one the anime is currently adapting, which it's at 42 chapters in length. In contrast, the tuning exams in Naruto covered 82 chapters, almost twice as long as Shie Hasaikai. And if you want to look at just the anime adaptations, the tuning exams lasted for 48 episodes, and that's if you don't include Konoha Crush. The arc then immediately follows the tuning exams and basically serves as its climax. 48 episodes puts the tuning exams at almost twice the length of the entirety of season 4 of Hiroaka. I highly doubt that Shie Hasaikai will even make up two thirds of this season, so even in the anime adaptations, the difference in arc lengths is pretty substantial, and it isn't just Hiroaka that displays this characteristic. Across the board, jump manga simply aren't being written the same way that they used to be. I'm not saying that jump manga are getting worse, but simply that they are being written with a different structure in mind. The days of massive, year-long arcs are basically gone unless a manga is nearing its conclusion, and this characteristic is only carried on by the shows that actually do run forever. As for the reason behind this, there are a lot of theories as to why this shift has taken place. One theory is that newer series tend to have a more structured approach from their inception, like The Promised Neverland and Demon Slayer Yaiba, which are supposedly already nearing the end of their manga runs despite them only getting their first anime adaptations this year. Another suggests that it's because the power systems and the worlds they exist in have become less intricately structured, choosing instead to focus on the more dramatic elements and interactions amongst characters, thus leading to an overall faster pace at which major plot events happen. Regardless of the reason for why it's happening, it does inevitably have an effect on how the story is perceived by the audience. I still love Hiroaka and think it's one of the best jump anime to be produced so far, but I'd hesitate to say that anything in it has had even a comparable amount of weight or grandiosity as any arc from part one of Naruto, simply because the amount of time spent on a given plot arc and how much information was poured into that arc is several times more than anything in Hiroaka. Story structures and seasonal formatting aren't the only reason that recreating the big three are impossible though. And another major factor that contributes to this lies in how anime fans watch anime. Try and remember what your media consumption habits were like back in 2007. The world was a very different place, and the internet was only just starting to become a more mainstream source of entertainment. YouTube had only been around for two years at this point, and felt more like a gimmick than the omnipresent attention-grabbing entity we know it as today. And streaming large quantities of anime from any website at all was practically impossible. Crunchyroll was still a small, illegal site, and Funimation hadn't even entered the streaming market at all yet. In this era, there were basically only four ways to watch anime. Cable television, 
expensive DVD sales, broken up into tiny chunks that somehow made it onto YouTube, or torrenting. The last of which, while giving the most access, most people hadn't really figured out yet, and was easily the riskiest of the four options in terms of computer safety. Because the big three were by and large the most popular shows, those were the ones that cable networks decided to broadcast and give the most advertising to because they were the safest bet. Consequently, torrenting also worked the same way to some degree. If no one's downloading a show, that usually means that no one's seeding the show, which makes it harder for future torrenters to get access to that content. Internet speeds were also exponentially slower than they are today, so waiting on something that was most likely never going to seed was kind of a lost cause. So, again, because the big three were the most popular shows, that usually meant that they were the ones that were being seeded the most, thus making them easier to access for other people, further perpetuating their popularity through sheer availability. Flash forward to 2019, and you can't even keep track of all the streaming services that host a plethora of anime titles. Crunchyroll is an industry titan that's close to ranking in the top 500 most visited websites on the planet, and more mainstream services like Netflix and Amazon Prime even have their own exclusive anime titles. Along with the multiplication of streaming services, we've also seen a rise in torrenting, especially with seasonal shows. It's easier to watch anime today than any other time in history, and so pretty much any show has ample opportunity to grab public interest. However, the downside to this is that it's very unlikely for an anime to hold that attention past its airtime. As soon as one season's over, you barely have enough time to let your thoughts settle before the next wave of hype starts. Sure, you don't have to watch shows like this, but this is how a lot of shows are watched now. When you combine this rise in accessibility with the fact that there is also way more anime being produced every season than there was a decade ago, it creates a situation where it's virtually impossible to hold a commanding level of attention for a significant amount of time past the air date of a given anime's last episode. There are a few that persist in the public consciousness even without constant sequels, but they don't dominate discussion in the same way whatever the most popular seasonal show is, and they certainly don't draw the same amount of attention as the big three ever did. This is perhaps the biggest reason why there will never be another big three. Because the type of entertainment distribution and consumption climate we currently live in is practically unrecognizable compared to the climate of the mid-2000s. A lot of people just don't like getting bogged down with 100 plus episode series anymore. The sheer quantity of 12 to 24 episode anime, as well as how easily digestible the shorter length is, has kind of made the concept of a never-ending broadcast a hindrance rather than a virtue. You could even argue that the higher quality of shows has led to anime fans having higher standards than before. When there's only maybe a hundred anime in total that are readily available to watch, you're much more forgiving of things like filler arcs and extended drops in animation quality. But when you're constantly inundated with at least 40 new shows every three months, you're afforded the luxury of being pickier with the titles you consume. The bottom line, though, is that the Big Three is simply not a title that can be inherited or passed down. Diversity of taste in anime and the speed at which anime is discussed online in modern fan culture is fundamentally opposed to the concept of just three shows reigning over everything. Some people may think that the new Big Three would be My Hero Academia, Black Clover, and Demon Slayer, while others might think that it's Attack on Titan, SAO, and Seven Deadly sins, but the fact remains that if you have to argue over what constitutes a current Big Three, then the term no longer applies to what you're talking about. The Big Three was never a title that was up for debate. It referenced three specific shows because everyone knew those three specific shows and understood why those shows were the ones lording over everything else. Their extreme length, lack of breaks in the narrative, and 
and the wearing of influences on their sleeves were exactly what anime fans wanted in a time where you didn't have access to thousands of titles at the push of a button. That's what it means to be the big three, and in all likelihood, it will never happen again. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and the more terrible business practices that surrounded the big three dying off is something to be celebrated. But that doesn't mean their legacy should be forgotten entirely. And trying to replace them will only lead towards a downward spiral of watering down what terms like this mean. The identity of the big three is inseparable from when these series came about and understanding that identity and how it was formed is crucial to understanding where we are now and where we'll go in the future. Special thanks to Jan Rogalski, Rourke Tenjoin, Christine Seibert, Call Me Catlord, Ryan Johnson, Jennifer Spencer, and all my other patrons for their generous support. My name is Ember, and I'll see you next time.